Welcome back to our pattern recognition Q&A. I've received again many of your questions and I selected a couple of those to be replied to in this video. And today's video will be all about convex optimization, Lagrangian mechanisms, Lagrange formulations and things, concepts like strong duality. And I'll pick a couple of very simple examples, which I hope will help you understanding those rather mathematical concepts. So looking forward into discussing some examples for convex optimization, Lagrangian optimization, regularization and strong duality. Okay, so I prepared this small set of slides and I summarized some of your questions. And then again, we are talking about pattern recognition machine learning. You know, it can always get worse. Imagine that you would be dealing with things like described in this book here. So don't worry about it. We'll get there and I'm making this Q&A videos such that you can understand the mathematics that we're discussing here in much better detail. So again, popular questions. Something that occurs quite frequently is emails like this one. Uh, I want to work in your lab. Pretty, pretty, please. Do you have a job? Can you give me a PhD topic? Can you supervise me and so on? Can you hire me? And unfortunately, it's rather hard to find a job in tech. And it's not like that we don't have any applications or something like this. So it's pretty competitive to find a good position. And you know, one does not simply find a job. But what if I told you that we can actually help you with finding a position? So we actually have a quite a few social media groups and in particular on LinkedIn and Facebook, we regularly post also job offers there, not only with us, but also with our partners. So if you're looking for a position, maybe also a PhD position, we publish those things always in our social media groups. So don't send just your CV to me, but you can join the groups. I will post the links here in the description of this video and we are publishing positions for assistant jobs at our university, for PhD positions, for postdoc positions. And we even have sometimes positions for professors, not just in our group, but really in our network collaborators all around the world. And we will post them there. And you are, of course, welcome to join those groups. And if you find something that you think is a good match, then send your CV and don't take an effort of just sending CVs out there to everybody. It's not very likely that we will have a position that is not advertised in this group. So if Nick Cage can still get work, then you can do anything. Keep that in mind. Okay, so let's go to the actual topic. We want to discuss a bit what convex optimization is and why it's so important. And you know, this is a convex function here, y equals x square. And the cool thing about this is if we do a minimization here, it doesn't matter if we start here, follow the negative gradient direction, we end up here. But if we were to initialize here, we would follow the gradient direction and we would still get the same minimum. So that's the cool thing about the convex optimization. It doesn't matter how you initialize, you will end up with a global minimum. So this is why many people like to do convex optimization and try to find mechanisms how you can actually formulate a specific problem convex and then you get these very nice solutions. Now I prepared a little quizzy for you. What's convex functions and what not? So let's do round one convex versus not convex round one. This function, well, you've probably seen it before. I'll give you some time to answer. And the answer is yes, this is a convex function. Okay, so let's go ahead. Round two, 
convex versus not convex. The L1 norm. Now, what do you think? Is it a convex function? You remember convexity. You connect two points of the plot and they always lie above the function. And you look in detail and it is convex again. And actually, we had quite a few of those penalty functions and those penalty functions that I'm showing here, all of them are also convex. So these will help you also in finding convex optimization problems if you would like to use those norms. That is actually quite helpful. So also those are convex. Let's go into round three. And here we have another penalty function that we discussed. This is the large error penalty function. And here you see that we are actually cutting off at a certain large error and assign a constant loss. And this one is not convex. And why is it not convex? Well, of course, we can find points that we connect and they lie above the function. But of course, there are points also like these two. If I connect them, we are lying below the function. So this is not a convex function. So convexity is quite cool and it can also be preserved. So there's also a couple of operations that conserve convexity. And this is, for example, the non-negative sum of convex functions. So if you have positive weights and you have some set of convex functions, then if you have a weighted sum of them, this is also convex. So this is useful. Element-wise maximum is also a convex function and also a composition saying that you apply one function of another function can also be a convex combination. But this is here only the case if g is non-decreasing. There's a couple of more variants of this and you can find them in your favorite math textbook about convexity. And we are not essentially writing up all of the possibilities of preserving convexity. But I just wanted to name these couple of examples here because they are relevant for our class. Also, you were very interested in constraint optimization and constraint optimization. We had this example in the class that we have, let's say, a plane and then you want to find the point that maximizes the plane given that it's on the circle. And this example seems straightforward, but it's again already a little bit complex because if we go into the Lagrangian formulation, we end up with a three dimensional construct and this is harder to visualize. So I decided to come up with an even simpler example. And this is the one that I want to discuss today. It is simply y equals x squared. And now I also need a constraint. So it can't be a 2D constraint, but we have a 1D function. So it's a 1D constraint and it's subject to x equals 1. So this is super easy because now the solution is x equals 1 because there is no other solution than x equals 1, right? Well, this is, of course, an academic example. And I want to show you how the Lagrangian then looks like and so on and how we can deal with this constraint. So this is the position that we want to find with the kind of constraint optimization. And we can already indicate it here in this graph. Now, how can we find this? And Lagrange, he tells us that we can set up a Lagrangian formulation here and we introduce a Lagrange multiplier lambda. And now you see that we multiply the constraint, the zero constraint actually just with lambda and add it to the original function. So we end up with L of x lambda. So we now have a two dimensional function. And this is given by x and lambda. And the Lagrangian is then simply the sum that is weighted with the Lagrange multiplier as we give the constraint to this. Now you see, if you compute the derivative with respect to lambda, you can immediately see that everything that is related to the original function will cancel out and only the constraint will be preserved in a critical point, meaning the position where lambda equals to zero is a position where the constraint is fulfilled. So this is one of the main ideas of the Lagrange multipliers. 
Let's have a look how this function behaves with different lambdas. So if we start with lambda zero, you can see we just have the original function, the constraint is gone. So this is simply the original function. Now let's play with lambda a bit and I'm choosing here minus one, minus two, minus three, minus four. And you see by choosing different lambdas, we change the function. And the function now is shifting up and down. So this is interesting, isn't it? And you can see the position where we have the peak is exactly the position where our constraint is fulfilled. So this is kind of interesting. So let's think about this a little more. So we want to find a solution for our Lagrangian. And what we just seen is that for lambda minus two, we seem to have found a solution. So for lambda minus two, the minimum of our Lagrangian is exactly the desired minimum where our constraint is fulfilled. So this seems to be an interesting function. Let's look at a 2D plot of this function. And here you can see how it actually behaves. You see on, on this axis that we have essentially a parabola that is smeared over the lambda domain. So we have different variants of this parabola and you can see that there is a critical point here, a saddle point where we go up and then down again. So we are looking for critical points in the Lagrangian because these are related to the solutions of our constraint optimization. So it's not necessarily an extremum, but it's a critical point that we are interested in. And this critical point is essentially found here with lambda equals to minus two. Okay, so you see that this is also not a bounded function. So if you simply do a gradient descent procedure here, you will not find the correct solution. This is even not bounded with respect to lambda. So you need a constraint minimization toolbox and for example, interior points methods in order to solve this. So it's not just that we have a solution here where we just minimize and do gradient descent and get the right solution. We need to be able to get the critical point. So that's the thing here. Now we can also have a look into the idea of strong duality. In order to do so, we compute the partial derivative of our Lagrangian with respect to x. And here, if you look at this one, you can see that we need to change it a little bit. We multiply the lambda into the bracket. And then you see it's very easy to actually compute the partial derivative with respect to x. So this is simply 2x plus lambda. Now, this is supposed to be a critical point. And this critical point is, of course, a position where this is equal to zero. So we can set it to zero and then we can solve for lambda. Now, if we look at this, then we can see that our constraint was x equals to one. And this results exactly in lambda equals to minus two. So this is already the right thing but we were actually looking for the dual. So this didn't give us the dual. So let's think about this again. Now we again have lambda equals to minus two X. Now we solve for X and you see that by solving for X, we get X equals to minus lambda over two. And this is also a very nice feature because we already know that lambda is minus two now. And if we plug it in here, you see the solution for lambda gives us also the solution in x. So we see that we get x equals one. We can take this now and plug it in into our Lagrangian function and get the, the dual. And you now you see that our dual is lambda squared divided by four minus lambda squared divided by two. So we can simplify this further. So this gives us then minus lambda to the power of two divided by four minus lambda. And this is interesting because now we have a function that only is dependent on lambda and x has canceled out completely. So let's have a look at this function and 
plot it here. So this was our original, our primal, and this is now our dual. Now, this is actually strong duality, and it's strong duality because the infimum over the primary is found exactly at the position where we also find the solution to our primal problem. So you see here, we have a zero duality gap. They both lie on the same line. So there is no difference between the solution of the primal and the solution of the dual. So the duality gap is zero. So yeah, that's actually pretty interesting. But given that we could already solve that x equals one, it's, um, yeah, we can feel now like a boss, yeah, because we have solved a quadratic function using strong duality. You had more questions. And another question was, what is regularized optimization? Now here you have a solution to a regression problem here on the left hand side. And typically you have many observations and you want to solve it and you can do it with what we discussed in our video about classification and regression. Now regularization you need when you have cases like this one. So you have just one observation and you want to fit a line. Well, then you end up with the problem that it's not unique. And the regularization can now help you with finding the correct line because, for example, you could constrain your slope to one and then you would probably end up with the solution. Yeah? So regularization can help you in those ill posed problems where you have trouble finding the correct solution. You use prior knowledge on the slope in order to get it in there. So you don't have to break your head. We can help you with regularization. And this is where our friend Tikhonov comes in. Tikhonov has proposed a particular kind of regularization and it's very useful to embed priors into our regression. So how can we do that? Well, the thing is we have again our primary function that is y equals to x squared. And again, we need to embed a constraint. Here again, the constraint x equals to one, but we express it now in terms of a distance. So we say the difference between x and one to the power of two is equal to zero. So we use a quadratic constraint here. And of course, this is a power of two, but you can generally also do this with two norms on vectors and so on. But we are only using a 1D space here, so it's simply the square, but generally you can also use two norms for Tikhonov regularization. If you use a one norm, then you end up with the lasso. So this doesn't matter that much right now, but you see that we have an equality constraint and how do we deal with equality constraints well we use our good old friend lagrange and we are multiplying it again with a lagrangian multiplier into our lagrangian function so here now the lagrangian is given as l of x and lambda so again the dimensionality increases and then x squared plus lambda times x minus one to the power of two Okay, so let's have a look at this function. And again, we rearrange it a bit. So first of all, we get rid of the square. And you see that we can express the square bracket using this term here. And we want to compute the derivative with respect to x again. This is why we multiply in the lambda. And then we can simplify this a bit so we can pull out the one plus lambda and just have one term of x squared, one term of x and one term without any x. And now we compute the derivative with respect to x. And you see that this then gives us two times one plus lambda times x minus two lambda. And as we already learned in the first part of this video, this needs to be zero because Otherwise, it wouldn't be a critical point. So we can set it to zero. Then we can divide by two and end up with this statement here. One plus lambda x minus lambda equals to zero. So we can still reformulate the bracket. So we take x 
plus lambda x minus lambda equals zero. Now we can bring over the minus x and divide by x minus one. And you see that this is our solution for lambda. And let's look at this in a little bit more detail. And remember, this is subject to x equals to one. Now let's plug this in and we see Ah, we have to divide by zero. So what kind of a problem is this? Why is this actually a good thing to do? Okay, let's think about this a little more. Now that we have a solution for lambda, we can also plug it in into a Lagrangian and try to find a solution for the problem without any lambdas and only with x's. If we do so, you see lambda only appears once. So we plug it in, then the sign flips, the divided by x minus one falls out and we can essentially get rid of the power of two on the right hand side. Then this gives us this function here. Let's think about this a little more. Multiply the x into the bracket and we see that the x to the power two cancels out and everything that remains is x. Now, this is also not nice because if we want to minimize this problem or maximize it, it's not bounded. It goes all the way to minus infinity and to plus infinity. So it doesn't help us either. Well, let's look into the dual. For the dual, we can go back here and then we solve for x instead of lambda. So we bring lambda to the other side and we divide by one plus lambda and this is our solution for x. Now with the solution for x, we can think about this and oh yeah, if we have the solution to x, we can build the dual. So we take now this version here of the Lagrangian that we encountered as one of the steps. So this is a very nice version because we already have only the one power of two of x and only one x in there. So we can take our solution for x and plug it in. And you see again, we have the bracket canceling out. So we have lambda to the power of two divided by lambda plus one, then the same term again, but with minus two and plus lambda. So this cancels out once. So we have minus lambda to the power of two divided by lambda plus one plus lambda. And now we're interested in solving for lambda. So we find the derivative of this guy with respect to lambda. And if you rearrange this a little bit, you find this is minus one over lambda plus one to the power of two. So this is the derivative of our dual and we need to set this to zero. And now let's think about this a little bit. Let's look at the plot of this function. You see that this guy only approaches zero at plus and minus infinity. So what the hell is this? How does it help us to solve this problem? Well, let's go back to our original problem and let's just play a bit with values of lambda. So let's look at the shapes that we take if we are changing lambda. And now we start with lambda zero. Again, lambda zero, we have the original solution. Now let's gradually increase lambda. And you see with increasing lambda, we get functions that gradually approach having the minimum exactly at the desired location. Then let's have a look at the solution for the Lagrangian with respect to x. And now you see this is Lagrangian of x equals to x. And this is this line. And you see that all of the minima that we have found with different versions of lambda, they all lie on this line. So this is already something that is kind of useful to understand what we're optimizing for. And you can also see that I have to essentially scale up lambda towards infinity to exactly reach the solution where we have fulfilled the constraint. Okay, well, let's look into the other direction. Now what's happening if we are choosing negative lambdas? And if you see, if we have already minus 0.5, we already get this parabola. 
and at minus 0.8 we get this and at minus 0.9 we already get this so this goes down very very quickly and we kind of have a function where the minimum goes down further and further and it's going completely into the wrong direction so this is absolutely not what we want to have and already at lambda equals to one we get a line so here the quadratic term cancels out completely and we get this line this line by the way intersects our other lagrangian the lagrangian of x exactly at the solution which we can see here but now if we look at our dual you see that at lambda minus one our dual is going towards negative infinity and then right after minus one we are coming back again from positive infinity so we have a huge jump in there because we are dividing by lambda and we have this kind of hyperbole that we have to deal with so this is the position where we then degenerate into a line and here you can see then that we can go ahead towards the solution on the other side so we can go below minus one in lambda and this might be interesting so let's look at what's happening here so let's try lambda minus two and now you see we're coming in essentially from the other side suddenly and with decreasing negative lambda you see we kind of also approach the position x equals one so we get to the solution x equals one this however is no longer a minimization problem but a maximization problem so we flip the parabola entirely and then we suddenly approach the solution from the other side so minus negative infinity is also giving us the right solution but this is entirely not how we thought that this would behave yeah so this is probably not the way that we want to go after so the solution is really at plus infinity for lambda and minus infinity for lambda we said the solutions in our Lagrangian they must be critical points of the Lagrangian and remember this is a necessary but not a sufficient condition but now we can have a look at this graph and you now understand why the change in lambda is causing this upside down flipping of the parabola and if you want to reach positions where the gradient approaches zero in both direction and then of course you have to go plus minus infinity with lambda otherwise you won't find such a position so this is a very interesting way of visualizing this and you may not understand anything in this plot if we hadn't looked at the examples earlier to understand what we are actually doing here okay so our regularization kind of works but not exactly as we intended to do it right so actually it might be a much better idea to restrict our problem only to have positive lambdas and what now happens is if we restrict lambda to be positive we are essentially going into a constraint optimization with inequality constraints so in inequality constraints you force the lagrangian multiplier to have a specific sign here we require the lambda to be positive now what would happen if we introduce this if we look at the dual so the orange curve in this plot um, all of this will be gone so all of the negative values will no longer be actual feasible values so they are not part of the optimization they are not feasible points in our problem so we can neglect those and you see that if we neglect those only the parabolas that i'm showing here are remaining so only the positive lambda parabolas are remaining and these would then be part of the Lagrangian that we seek to optimize so still our solution is plus infinity here to get the exact fulfillment of the constraint and to be honest we probably want this constraint to be exactly fulfilled but if we want it to be exactly fulfilled we now have convex constraints 
and a convex primary. So this means that we have a strong dual problem again. So this is strong convexity and you can see here our duality gap is exactly zero. So you see that here again this line duality gap zero. This is exactly where we approach the solution. So this is pretty cool. And if you are attending our lecture, you will also find the concept of Slater's conditions. And if you have a convex functions and convex inequality constraints, then Slater's conditions hold and we have strong duality. Yay. Now let's have a look at the kind of 2D surface plot emerges here. So we now get rid of all the negative parts. So I set it to zero here for the visualization. And you see that this is the kind of Lagrangian that we seek to optimize. Again, the solution here is at positive infinity. Maybe we don't want to have this constraint completely fulfilled. So why does it have to be zero? So how about setting the constraint to be below 0 0.1. So we want to have a small norm. Yeah? So we don't want it to be exactly zero, but we want to have it below 0 0.1. And then we can set this again up to constraint that is to zero, you set up the Lagrangian and so on. And if you do that, you suddenly get this kind of function as solution. And now you see because we introduced this kind of parameter, it could be an epsilon here, the point zero 0.01, you see that our curve doesn't increase anymore. So there is a lambda at which the condition is fulfilled. So if we are less away than point 0.1, we have a feasible solution. And then we also have a gradient that is zero everywhere. So we have a critical point. So you could set some epsilon that is larger than zero and force the inequality then to be essentially in this kind of fashion. And what you then realize that setting this epsilon is essentially the same as setting a specific lambda that is positive enough to have the constraint fulfilled. And this then gives rise to this whole chain of argument why many people then say, okay, the Lagrange multipliers, they are just engineering constants and you set them to a sufficient number and it's correct. Actually, if you set the Lagrange multiplier to a specific value, you're implicitly choosing this epsilon. But you would have to do the math to actually determine the epsilon value. Instead, you can just set the lambda to a fixed value and then you remember you have a convex combination of a convex constraint and a original convex function. So in this kind of domain, you're then even dealing with a convex optimization problem and you can go ahead and just do gradient descent. So this brings us back to the convexity and why the regularization can help us setting up convex problems. So you could argue a little bit that regularized optimization is a little bit like in this figure here. So you engineer the parameters just to be able to find a good solution. So remember, math is your friend and math will always be there for you, even if there is no one left on Earth. So I hope you enjoyed this little video. I thank you for your attention. And of course, if you have more questions, just go ahead and ask them using the comment functionality, using the different ways of interacting with us in forums that we have for FAU students, but also on social media, on different platforms. I'd be happy to take your question if they're related to the stuff that I'm actually talking about in the video and not about things that are completely wild, like solving your homework problems and so on. So these questions I won't answer, but if you're interested in this class and you have questions and they require a little more to actually be answered, I might even be inclined to make another video like this one. So thank you very much for watching. If you like the video, then I would be very much 
looking forward to welcome you again in another of this question and answer videos but for sure i'll be producing also other lecture videos so stay tuned bye bye